بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم إني أسألك وأتوجه إليك بنبيك نبي الرحمة محمد صلى الله عليه وآله يا أبا القاسم يا رسول الله يا إمام الرحمة يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا الحسن يا أمير المؤمنين يا علي بن أبي طالب يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا فاطمة الزهراء يا بنت محمد يا قرة عين الرسول يا سيدتنا ومولاتنا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهة عند الله اشفعي لنا عند الله يا أبا محمد يا حسن ابن علي أيها المجتبى يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا عبد الله يا حسين بن علي أيها الشهيد يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا الحسن يا علي بن الحسين يا زين العابدين يا ابن رسول الله 
يا حجة الله على خلق يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا جعفر يا محمد بن علي أيها الباقر يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا عبد الله يا جعفر بن محمد أيها الصادق يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا الحسن يا موسى بن جعفر أيها الكاظم يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا الحسن يا علي بن موسى أيها الرضا يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا جعفر يا محمد بن علي أيها التقي الجواد يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله 
يا أبا الحسن يا علي بن محمد أيها الهاد النقي يا بن رسول الله يا حنجة الله على خلقي يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا محمد يا حسن ابن علي أيها الزكي العسكري يا ابن رسول الله يا حنجة الله على خلقي يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا وصي الحسن والخلف الحجاء أيها القائم المنتظر المهدي يا ابن رسول الله يا حنجة الله على خلقي يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهان عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله حاجات يا سادتي وموالي إني توجهت بكم أئمتي وعدتي ليوم فقري وحاجتي إلى الله وتوسلت بكم إلى الله واستشفعت بكم إلى الله فاشفعوا لي عند الله واستنقذوني من ذنوبي عند الله فإنكم وسيلتي إلى الله وبحبكم وبقربكم أرجو نجاة من الله فكونوا عند الله رجائي يا سادتي يا أولياء الله صلى الله عليه مجمعين ولعن الله وعدا الله ظالميهم من الأولين والآخرين آمين رب العالمين Muhammad wa ali Muhammad salawat Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Wuha ka kaaba Ye ha ka marika Bulandiya kar Bala آہی جانے ادھر ہے قبلہ 
इधर है सजदा कौन अफजल खुदा ही जाने बदलती हालत
My dear elders, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. On behalf of Wessex Jamaat, we extend our condolences to the Imam of our time and to all Mu'mineen around the world on the occasion of the Shahadat of our seventh Holy Imam, Imam Musa al kadhim alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Please kindly take note of the following announcements. Tomorrow, the 26th night of Rajab, 1442 AH, is the wafat of Hazrat Abu Talib alayhi salam. There will be no local Wessex Jamaat program, so Mu'mineen are requested to consider participating in the online programs hosted by other Jamaats. This Thursday, 11th March, is the 27th night of Rajab. Wessex Jamaat will be holding a program for the evening of Mi'raj and Bi'that, commencing at 7.30 p.m., live on our YouTube channel. For program details, please refer to the published timetable or the Al Mahdi Center website. On Wednesday, the 17th of March, the Jamaat will be holding a Jashan and Wiladat program to celebrate the Wiladat of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam, and Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. With local reciters from within the community. The event will commence at 7.30 p.m. and of course will be live on our YouTube channel. Further details will be circulated by email in due course, inshallah. Despite not being able to hold programs within the Al Mahdi Center at present, the Jamaat has continued to incur significant costs with regards to essential maintenance and repairs. Please consider setting up a standing order to support the Jamaat through regular donations. Furthermore, you can sponsor Wessex Jamaat programs either as a partial or complete sponsorship for the thawab of your marhumin. For further information, please contact info at almahdi.org.uk. Alhamdulillah, we are blessed to have Sheikh Muhammad Al-Hilli, who will be delivering the majlis for this evening. Sheikh Hilli is well known to the community here at Wessex Jamaat, and on behalf of the EC, I would like to thank him for gracing us once more. As we welcome him for the majlis, can I ask that we do so in a way that is traditional for Wessex Jamaat with the recitation of three salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil farajahum. <coughs> أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرتسى وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا نحن نحيي الموتى ونكتب ما قدموا وآثارهم وكل شيء أحصيناه في إمام مبين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected elders, sisters and brothers in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته The preservation and accountability of the legacy of the human beings is a phenomena that has been confirmed indeed by the Holy Quran and Islamic teachings 
We find today that when somebody talks about the legacy of a human being, what comes to mind is what they actually have left behind after leaving this world. Those of you who are in the legal profession are aware of the definition of a legacy in as far as the legal terms are concerned. But in general terms, many of us will associate a long lasting legacy with that which has had a deep impact upon human beings, upon society, an impact that can be positive and also can be negative. Indeed, sometimes you come forward and you find that, that some people have left a devastating legacy, legacy that leaves a lot to be desired. That's why sometimes it's greater than the actual person's life, meaning people will only begin to benefit or are harmed after that particular individual leaves the world. It doesn't always mean that the legacy of an individual is indeed reflected in their lifetime. Sometimes there are people out there who are unsung heroes, who are working tirelessly. And Allah Taala wants their remembrance to be elevated, wants them to be continuously indeed uh, remembered by human beings. And therefore you'll find that after they leave this world, people remember them, people understand what they did. And the opposite is actually true. Therefore, the question that arises today, and that is, what does the Quran say regarding a legacy of a human being? Come to Surah Yasin, verse number 12. You and I recite this many times, don't we? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, inna nahnu nuhyi al-mawta wa naktubu ma qaddamu wa atharahum. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says, this athar is perhaps something that can be equated or understood as a legacy. It's what they leave behind. Athar al-shay in Arabic means what somehow there are signs of something that you have indeed left. For example, if a animal passes by, they would say, Hunalika atharun lil haywan. There is a, a sign, there is something that the animal has left, either for example, uh, marks on the ground, something that indicates that there was an animal there. Similarly, the Quran comes forward and says, that don't think that the legacy of a human being is something only for human beings to admire. That the legacy of a human being is for only human beings to benefit from or to indeed be harmed from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we will preserve it. We will document it. We will have it. It's not something that will be indeed forgotten. Inna nahnu nuhyil mawta. We will verily, surely give life to those who are dead. We will indeed document and present what they presented in their lives and what they left behind. And therefore the question that arises as far as ulama of tafsir is concerned and others who have discussed this notion within Islamic literature. In Islamic teachings, a legacy is divided into two. Please focus on to this so that we can relate it into our own lives and the holy individual we are recalling and remembering his shahada tonight. When it comes to legacy, there is a personal legacy. This is in terms of family members. This is in terms of matters directly related to an individual, whereby an individual has an impact on a small group of people. Sometimes it could be wealth. Sometimes it could be possession. It is a somehow limited circle of influence and impact. But this is not in terms of quantity, but more so quality. In other words, when an individual who is wealthy dies and their wealth is given to a cat or a dog, that is not a great legacy, yes? It is not about how wealthy an individual dies. It's about whether their heart has indeed gained that wealth when they die, yes? In the idea that they have indeed invested in their akhirah and they are ensuring that what they have left before, behind will benefit them and others without a shadow of a doubt. It is about how much they have sold what they have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when a human being moves from one property to another, those of you who have been involved in property, you know, moving from one house to another, often what you find is there are furniture or equipment that you don't need. Sometimes you give it away. Sometimes you say, you know what, it's good quality. Maybe, 
I can get someone to buy this. There are those who are experts in going car boot sales yes, or using certain apps or whatever to sell secondhand products, eBay, whatever, in order to gain something out of furniture or equipment that they don't necessarily need. Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whilst you're alive, sell, sell, sell to me. Yes, we sell to Allah without a shadow of a doubt. Yes. Allah wa ta'ala, Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 111. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah ashtara minal mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al-jannah. Allah wa ta'ala has purchased from the believers their souls as well as their wealth. And in return, he will give them pounds, dollars. No, no, no. Jannah, paradise, the eternal bliss, eternal salvation. And therefore, the notion that exists is the first part of a legacy is one that an individual has had a business transaction with the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ultimately, Allah wa ta'ala is not the beneficiary. It is us who benefit without shadow of a doubt. Similarly, the idea of children that we leave behind, individuals, sons and daughters who perform righteous deeds is considered to be part of the first dimension of a legacy. That's why the Holy Prophet, Rasul al-A'zam, wa Nabi al-Akram, Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam it comes forward and says what? He says that إِلَا مَا تَبْنُ آدَمْ إِنْ قَطَعْ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ The human being dies. Their deeds are severed except for three things. And of course we know that صدق جارية علم ينتفع به But the third element is ولد صالح يدعو له That a righteous son or daughter ولد in Arabic does not mean son only. It means son or daughter. It refers to both genders. So the hadith says, very famous hadith, Sunni and Shia, they narrate it. He says that the legacy of the human being sometimes is defined through the children. Yes, through the way that the children remember them. He specifically, the Holy Prophet of Islam says, Yad'ula. The supplication is of key importance. Because many a times we associate the righteous deeds, the dedication of our children, but also the fact that they will not forget their parents when they have left this world. Continuously in their minds, as far as a'mal, sadaqa, yes, as far as visiting their graves as well is concerned. But the second part is the greater impact, the greater benefit, the greater legacy, so to speak. This is when it affects such a large number of people, usually visionary individuals, leaders, those who build for the future, yes, those who invest in institutions and organizations that are dedicated towards making a positive contribution in society. They have this himma in the Quran. Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there is this himma. Himma means that drive, that dedication, that commitment, that worry. I'm not just going to leave this world, eat, drink, and do what everyone else does. I've got to do something that will impact some people. And this is also praised in the beautiful words of the Holy Ahl al-Bayt Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam famously says, Man sanna sunnatan hasana kanat lahu ajruha wa ajru man amila biha ila yawm al-qiyama. Whomsoever does a righteous deeds, they will get the reward of it. And whomsoever does that, and not only does this righteous deeds, does a sunnah of it, encourages others to perform it too, Allah will give them the reward until the day of Qiyamah of whom whoever benefits. Yes. And of course, the continuation of the hadith goes on to say whomsoever institutes any bad deeds, they will get the punishment, the sayyah, also until the day of Qiyamah. When we come to the lives of great individuals, such as the Holy Prophets, as well as their successors, their legacy is both in terms of the personal as well as the deeper, bigger, more societal impact, so to speak, are there for people to admire and indeed benefit from. This includes the seventh holy Imam, Babu al Hawaj, the ninth of the ship of salvation of the Ahl al Bayt, Al Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al Kadhim, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi wa There is no doubt in our minds 
When we come to study the biography and the illustrious life of these holy individuals, including Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, we come to the conclusion that yes, there are so many elements that can be indeed benefited from and the legacy is tremendous, it's powerful, it's empowering, it's truly beneficial, yes? But when you look at the first element, and as far as the legacy is concerned, the so-called personal elements, the personal aspects, you know, more of a closer circle, yes, the greats also have those. We look at Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam and today, there are millions of Musawi Sayyids, perhaps, around the world. The Saad al musawiyin all originate towards whom? Towards Imam Musa al Jafar. Peace and blessings be upon him. Of course, he was the Imam that had the largest number of sons and indeed daughters. Some narrations point to 34, even others 37, and so on. But what we recognize is because they had spread in so many parts, or at least the Middle East, these Sayyids who are from the Musawi line indeed are so many, yes? But you also look at the, obviously the teachings, the morality, the ethics, the spirituality, the politics, the social reform elements found within the teachings of all the Ahlul Bayt, but including Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadham and definitely that constitutes part of his legacy. But within the next few minutes, I'd like to discuss one subject, which perhaps, perhaps, and Allah knows best, is one that has seldom been discussed with regards to the legacy of Imam al kadhim alayhi salam. And that is the tashayyu of Baghdad, the, the way in which Baghdad indeed became or encompassed who welcomed the Shias of the Ahl al-Bayt I would like to show through what we have indeed been presented with the literature that we have today through the research that how Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam indeed established this great legacy in this particular city. How did Baghdad become a place of the lovers of Ali Muhammad? Yes, and how it has developed over the years are mainly due to the efforts of the seventh holy Imam, Imam Babu al Hawaj Musa ibn Ja'far, peace and blessings be upon him. When we study the development of the Shia, you know, as far as geographical areas are concerned within the Islamic world, it could be argued that after Medina al Munawwara, because of course Shiaism started in Medina without a shadow of a doubt, yes. At the time of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and it's outside the scope of this discussion to, to discuss the way the Shias originated. But Medina al Munawwara is the first city that indeed in which the Shias would become uh, greater in number. But the second, arguably, is Kufa, a city which was formally established 17 years after the migration of the Holy Prophet. Peace and blessings be upon him and his family. But you might ask, why Kufa? Why is Kufa considered the second city to somehow be referred to or to encompass or to welcome or to have a stronghold of the Shia population? What was the social political circumstances that led to Kufa becoming Shia, by and large? Well, number one, the migration of the Yemeni tribes to live in Kufa. My dear sisters and brothers, Yemen and the history of Yemen with the Shia of Ali Muhammad is immense. Tribes that have become Muslim mainly because of the commander of the faithful, Mawla al-Muttaqeen wa Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallam And what had happened, of course, was that Imam Ali alayhi salam was sent by the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Yemen in order to teach, in order to invite, in order to answer the people of Yemen's question and to introduce to them the religion of Islam. And they were very much inspired by Amir al muminin You'll find that, you know, some of these great companions of Imam Ali alayhi salam are from Yemen. Yes, you, you find the likes of Malik al-Ashtar, Uwais al-Qarani, and so on. These are Yemeni companions of the Imam alayhi salam. When, for example, Imam Ali alayhi salam had reached Sana'a, you know, the modern day capital of Yemen, he rented a small house there from a lady who was a Yemeni lady. And after he left, it was turned into a masjid. Until today, it's still there, subhanAllah. It's called Masjid al-Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Karram Allah wajha, it's written on it. Ta'assasa, it was formed year eight after Hijrah. 
Amazing. That the mosque is still being preserved as a hallmark of the legacy of Amir and Mu'mineen. Peace and blessings be upon him. That's number one. So the impact of the people of Yemen, they moved towards Kufa. They saw that Imam Ali alayhi salam, yes, was going to make the city the center of his governance and therefore they flocked towards Kufa. Number one. Number two, Ammar ibn Yasir, before Amir al-Mu'mineen had got there, Ammar ibn Yasir was the first governor of Kufa. And of course, Ammar ibn Yasir was close, Rabbanullah ta'ala alayhi to Imam Ali alayhi salam. That also encouraged people to come to Kufa as well. And later on, when during the Khilafah of the third Khalifa, Uthman ibn Affan, there was the Umayyad corrupt governors there, people like Al-Walid ibn Uqba, you know, they misbehaved, they were drunkard, you know, they would pray Salatul Fajr four rakats, right? And they wanted more. It was Imam Ali alayhi salam and his representative in Kufa who sought to establish justice. People loved that. People saw that Ali ibn Abi Talib would not be quiet and silenced by such occurrences that were happening. Therefore, when it came to the support of Amir al-Mu'mineen in Jamal, people of Kufa stood with Amir al-Mu'mineen. So Amir al-Mu'mineen, it is established that he was not yet in Kufa by the time of Jamal. He moved afterwards. He saw the support of the people of Kufa and then he, what? He relocated the center of his governance in that city. Fast forward to the Abbasi state. They were very Kufa, as it, you know, it was well known that they tried to, of course, deceive the masses, that they, you know, uh, wanting to defend the rights of the Ahl al-Bayt, against the Umayyads, you know. For example, you know, did you know that the first two Abbasid caliphs, the Safah and Mansur al-Duwaniqi, they were people who walk in the streets and they were known as Maddahin of Ahl al-Bayt. They would recite, you know, poems in praise of Ali Muhammad, all in the form of deception to say that we are the defenders of the Ahl al-Bayt, these Umayyads, we are with Ali Muhammad, right? But once they gained power, of course, their true nature emerged, and they thought to themselves, this Kufa is full of Shia. What are we going to do here? So what they decided was that they would have the center of the governance in an area very close to Kufa, known as Medina al Hashimiyah, a few kilometers away from Kufa. But they then worried we are so close to Kufa, we could be taken over. Yes. And so let's go a bit further, but still not too far from Kufa. So in 145 after Hijrah, they designated an area. They designated an area for them to have this particular uh, state of theirs, the Abbasid state, to be established. And then they moved to it in 149. Four years after, after it was, uh, there was a lot of constructions and so on, that area was called then Baghdad, yes? So 149 after Hijrah is when the Abbasi state moved towards the Iraqi capital today, Baghdad. And that was one year after Shahada of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, and of course, uh, you know, when Imam al-Qadr alayhi salam had the, the, uh, the, uh, the responsibility of the Imama. And so when they chose Baghdad, as the capital, this remained the case for about 500 years until 656 after Hijrah, which was 1258 AD, except for some years which they moved it to Samarra or Surra Manra'a because of, again, some political circumstances. Some of the caliphs, some of the years moved them to Samarra, but then it was brought back to Baghdad. But here's what the problem was for the Abbasids. They did not know that in that area, Shia were already present. Shia were already in Baghdad. You ask me how? In the year 38 after Hijrah, Amir al-Mu'mineen, peace and blessings be upon him, with Imam al-Hassan, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, were coming back for their army from Rahrawan, the battle against the Khawarij. They were going towards Kufa, and they stepped to, stopped in a place next to the Dijla uh, river. And so they rested, they performed salah, and of course they needed water. So Amir al-Mu'mineen dug a well. There was a Christian monk there. He came across and said to them, there is no one who knows that there is a well here except that they are a, a, a vicegerent of Allah and the successor of a prophet. Yes. And so that well, this area later on was built by a man by the name of Buratha and was given the masjid by the title of Masjid Buratha. Until today, it's still there in Baghdad, not far from Kadhameen. Yes. 
where the will of Imam Ali is still present. Yes, I myself, I myself have indeed witnessed and have seen this particular mosque and this well in Baghdad. It's a place to visit if you can ever, if you are visiting Baghdad uh, or for Ziyara, you are able to see some of these sites. Masjid Buratha, it's called. Yes, so because of this occurrence, she has began to come, not in huge numbers, but they were there. And when the Abbasids moved towards Baghdad, what happened was they began to encourage others to move. So this time the Shias, knowing that there are already Shias there, began to also congregate or come towards Baghdad as well. In the year 162 after Hijrah, the Abbasid ruler, so this is approximately 14 years after Baghdad was established, 13, 14 years, the Abbasid ruler in Baghdad, by the name of Al-Mahdi al-Abbas, he heard about the popularity of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim alayhi salam. When he heard about them, you know, he said, I cannot let him in Medina be, you know, free to do whatever he wants. He's going to rise. He's going to organize a popular uprising against me. Therefore, he decided to arrest and summon Imam al-Kadhim all the way from Kufa, from Medina, all the way towards Baghdad. So, Imam Ali Salam was taken forcefully out of Medina. He entered Baghdad. When he entered, he was arrested and placed in prison. This was the first time Imam al Kadhim Ali Salam was placed in prison. And of course, later he was placed in prison a number of times. But this was the first time. Now, at that night, when Al Mahdi al Abbasi, this Abbasid Caliph, saw in a dream, Amir al Mu'minin, peace and blessings be upon him, very much distressed, reciting the verse in the Holy Quran, chapter 47, verse number 22, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فهل, says فهل عسيتم إن توليتم أن تفسدوا في الأرض وتقطعوا أرحامكم. He says, Are you seeking to create facade on this earth and sever your blood relations? So he woke up distressed, this Mahdi Abbasi. He called the Imam. Imam was brought to him. And he said to him of the dream, told him what he saw. Then he said to the Imam, are you going to guarantee that you will never have an uprising against me or my sons? Imam replied, Wallahi, ma fa'altu dhalik. I have never done this. Wala huwa min sha'ni. And it's not something I'm looking to do. So al Mahdi Abbasi was very much calmed by the response of the Imam. Freed him, gave him 3,000 dinar and said to him, you're free to go. Now, what is interesting here, and I was delighted when I was studying the life of Imam al kadhim alayhi salam, a while back, I came across a number of interesting narrations that some of the historians have ignored or perhaps have not focused on. And that is when Imam al kadhim saw that Al-Mahdi al-Abbasi was kind of now comforted, he utilized this opportunity, according to some historical works, and he went to Karbala. When he went to Karbala, he stayed in Karbala for three years, from the year 162 to the year 165, right? And in Karbala, he had a house, and he also built some form of an educational center, some form of a madrasa. Scholars, thinkers, you know, scientists, people came from different parts and would benefit from Imam al kadhim alayhi salam. And it seems that this was something that was hidden in history because the Abbasid Caliph, al Mahdi al Abbasi, was not concerned as much by Imam al Kadhim and was not worried about what he was doing in Karbala. So he let him do what he did, apparently, according to the, these narrations. Because today, when you go to Karbala, and may Allah wa ta grant you all to uh, go back to the city of Hussein and Abbas, may Allah wa ta grant us opportunity of ziyara soon, inshallah. We have been indeed, you know, really missing the ziyara due to the pandemic, but inshallah, we are able to return soon. Now, if you are able to go, there is a, a place called Maqam Imam al Kadhim close to the Shrine of Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. It's an area known as Aqdus Sada. There, it is said that it is where Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam stayed in those three years. Therefore, based on these narrations, it was Imam al Kadhim who was the first to establish an educational establishment and an institution in Karbala. It's amazing realization. Now, what is also possible is that before he came to Karbala, Imam al kadhim began to plant the seeds for the strengthening of the Shia presence in Baghdad when he was released. And this is where we have the famous story 
where Imam al kadhim alayhi salam would be walking and he would hear music being played in a house. You know this story without shadow of a doubt. Yes, mentioned by many of the speakers and ulama. When he saw a lady outside taking out the kind of rubbish, he asked, is the person of the house a slave or a master? And she said, no, he's a master. He's not a slave. He said, yes, because if he was a slave, he would have respected his master. And so when that man emerged, he had this conversation with this slave and said, what has happened? And she described Imam al-Kadhim to him. And he ran. He saw Imam al kadhim and he ran barefoot. When he reached Imam al kadhim alayhi salam, he begged him for forgiveness. And he is known as Bishr al-Hafi. Now, Bishr al-Hafi, what's interesting is that there is an area in Baghdad today known as Mahallat al-Shaykh Bashar. Throughout time, Bishr turned to Bashar. And so it's still there. That area, subhanAllah, the Ahl al-Bayt, you know when you talk about legacy, Athar, wherever they go, whatever they do, People preserve Imam al Kadhim was here. Imam al Rida was here. Imam al Jawad was here. SubhanAllah. And so, what we know for sure is that Imam al Kadhim salam, began to work to train the Shia and to begin this movement within the city of Baghdad. Yes, and on the outskirts, as well as, of course, in Kambala. As sadly, history doesn't tell us much about the details of what actually happened. Perhaps, of course, everything was done very very quietly. You know, the Bani Abbas were very much watching. But Imam Ali Salam's interaction with guards, other prisoners, people who met with him definitely had a major impact. Now, you might argue and say, okay, how do you know? What can we say scientifically you know, or, or academically to present proof that Imam Ali Salam had indeed planted those wonderful seeds. And could we see the impact of them several years later? Yes. Because, of course, later Imam al Kadhim in the year 179 was arrested by Harun al Abbasi. That was, of course, the start of four years where Imam Ali Salam was in prison. Because many times people think that Imam Ali Salam was perhaps in prison for 15, 16, 20 years. It's unlikely. It's very, very unlikely. Yes, there is not belittling how many years Imam Ali Salam was under prison and torture, but it is likely to be in the range of five, six years, and even perhaps less. But when it comes to um, Imam al Kadhim Ali Salam's funeral, this was the first demonstration of the Shia population in Baghdad. Because what happened was there was a huge funeral procession of Imam al Kadhim Ali Salam, it fills the streets. Yes, Sulaiman, who was the uh, uncle of Harun al-Abbas on that day, is recorded to have said, why do we see so many people? What has happened? Yes, so all these people have come forward to take part in the funeral procession of Imam al -Kadhim. It's likely, although it can't be said that all of them are Shia, it's likely that many of them were indeed of the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt. Similarly, a few years later, there was a huge procession of funeral for Imam al kadhims grandson. Imam Muhammad al-Jawad al-Taqi salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Narrations tell us there were 10,000 swords that were raised with his coffin. You know, it was a kind of customary thing for people to raise their swords in terms of, you know, grieving at that time, 10,000. There were thousands who came out later on to greet Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam and his family when Imam al-Hadi was summoned by al mutawakkil al-Abbasi on his way towards Sulam al-Ra'a, Sam al He passed through Baghdad. And there were thousands of people who indeed saw him and indeed would greet him. Hence, what happened then is that Imam al-Hadi realized that in Baghdad there needs to be leadership for the Shia. Therefore, he appointed a man by the name of a Sheikh Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri. You might know his name and you should because he's one of the four wikala, four uh, representatives of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr al-Zaman, Allah ta'ala. Sharif. And Sheikh Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri was appointed by the fourth holy imam to be the representative of Imam al-Hadi in Baghdad to answer questions, to guide the masses, to collect the funds and so on. And later on, of course, his uh, son Muhammad ibn Uthman, al Hussein ibn Ruh, and Ali ibn Muhammad in summary, they were also uh, appointed by the 11th imam and of course the 12th imam 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasten his reappearance. And all their graves, these four representatives of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, where are in Baghdad today. Yes, so they did not go anywhere else. They recognized the importance of Baghdad. They stayed in Baghdad. Baghdad was their center of their uh, movement. And indeed, they died there as well. Later, the Imams alayhi salam, um, would focus indeed on Baghdad as well. And you can see that after the minor occultation, you know, which lasted for 70 years, the, there was a number of Shia scholars who began to settle in Baghdad as well. For example, you all heard of a Kitab Al-Kafi, yes, by Sheikh Al-Kulayni, Allah Ta'ala Maqamah. This Sheikh Al-Kulayni is buried in Baghdad, in Kardamain, in close proximity to the shrine of the 7th and the 9th Holy Imam. In fact, the first Hawza, proper Hawza, yes, this might be surprising for some, the first proper Hawza in the Shia world, with where the scholars and the students interact in a particular way, where there are salaries that are given, this Shahriya was established by Sheikh Al-Mufid, who died year 413 after Hijrah. Then after him, yes, his student Sayyid Al-Murtaba, who died 436 after Hijrah. Then after him, Sheikh Al-Ta'ifa, Sheikh Al-Tusi, who moved it to Najaf in 448 because of the attack by the Seljuks. Yes, so, you know, that circumstance forced Sheikh Al-Tusi to move the Hawza towards Najaf and somehow Baghdad never recovered after that in that sense, but still remained. And the, the area that really remained stronghold for the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, which was pivotal throughout the years, including now, is an area known as Maqabur Quraysh, which was later named as Al-Mashhad al kavani Now, what happened there is that this was the place in which Imam al-Kadhim had purchased, according to some narrations, and he asked for him to be buried there and of course Imam Al-Jawad Al-Taqi also was buried there and this shrine of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far known as al kadhimain shrine continues till today to be an area in which the thinkers, philosophers, jurists all throughout the time were drawn into that particular shrine and in fact we're told in historical terms there were number of years in which Al-Aza al, al husayni the remembrance of the uh, tragedy of Karbala was forbidden in many parts of the country except in the shrine in, of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, peace be upon him, and Imam al-Jawad So it became, a, it became a magnet that held the Shias together, yes? And, you know, we are told that the presence of the Shia in Kadamein kept always the balance of power because you know what happened was Baghdad, of course, till today and for many, many years, Baghdad was, um, you know, a city that rulers would consider their capital. Yes. And the fact that there were a sizable Shia population that continued to grow and were present in many parts of the city, in addition to Kadamein and Karkh and other places and Karada today. Yes, enable, made sure that the rights of the Shias are not forgotten or necessarily sidelined. Of course, with the despotic, tyrannical regime of Saddam, that was something else. But what we are told, of course, and how we understand briefly through this brief look, there was a clear plan by Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al kadhim alayhi salam to ensure that Baghdad, you know, has this presence of Shia consolidated. By the way, one of the things that Imam al kadhim alayhi salam also did was to have people within the government of the Abbasids who would support the Shia and the Mu'mineen. And amongst them was who? Ali ibn Yaqteen, Allah ta'ala alayhi. You know, this Ali ibn Yaqteen, a great individual, much, you know, has been written about or at least discussed about how he was given this, tasked with this responsibility by Imam al kadhim alayhi salam to somehow be in the with amongst a minister in the government of Harun al Abbasi, but he gave him the oppression, not uh, the condition, not to oppress anyone and to help and aid the followers of the Ahl al Bayt in particular. And many a times he wanted to resign, but Imam Ali Salam kept telling him, No, no, you stay. And Imam said to him, Actually, your post became the source of honor for your brothers because through you, God compensates the Shia and ends the plot of the enemies. 
He was a source of great economic help, you know. And even his sons, whenever Imam al Qadim alayhi salam would need anything, you know, um, he would write to his sons, who would take it to whom to Ali ibn Yaqtin himself, and he would secretly return this Ali ibn Yaqtin secretly returned money back to the Shia because of the difficult circumstances that Abbasids um, actually uh, made them go through. And um, he was, of course, practicing taqiyya, dissimulation. Yes, Ali ibn Aqtin, a great example of how an individual is able to work within an establishment as far as, as long as they don't oppress, yes, as long as they work within the guidance of those who are learned, such as today our ulama and our as long as they make a positive contribution and indeed defend the honor of the mu'mineen, then that is something great. And that's why Imam al-Kadhim would constantly ensure that Ali ibn Yaqteen is well looked after. For example, once Harun gifted these clothes and ex an expensive robe to Ali ibn Yaqteen, he liked him, and he immediately gave it to the Imam. Imam alayhi salam returned it. Yes. And one person who hated Ali ibn Yaqteen came to Harun and said, did you know all the stuff you gave him, he's given to Ali ibn Musa, uh, he's given to Musa ibn Ja'far. At that moment, Harun summons Ali and says, where are the things I've given you? He says, I'll bring them. And he bought them. And that individual was punished, yes. And of course, the famous story of the wudu, in which again, Imam al-Kadhim says to Ali ibn Aqtim, do wudu the way Ahl al-Sunnah do wudu. Because once Harun was also suspicious, and he saw Ali ibn Aqtim performing wudu, in that particular way, and his suspicion was kind of somehow removed. That's why we find that the evidence of the presence of Shia when Imam al Kadhim was in the dungeons is also documented uh, in history. Yes, that there were Shia who sought to mobilize efforts to release him despite the ter terrifying um, you know, atmosphere that existed in that area, for example. We have a man by the name of Abi Zuhr ibn Nasah al-Burji. He says that I was sitting with a man by the name of Ibn al-Sakid. This Ibn al-Sakid, famous person who was a great scholar of Arabic and later, of course, he was punished by Al-Mutawakkil for saying that the sandal of Qambara are better than the sons of Mutawakkil. Now, he says, I was sitting with Ibn al-Sakid in a masjid that was right next to the house of a sindi ibn Shahik. Now, a sindi ibn Shahik was this uh, terrible individual who was the last individual to torture and really uh, place Imam uh, uh, al salam in these dungeons, these dark dungeons. And he was the one who passed on the poison to Imam al salam. So this mosque that they were pr present in was right next to the house of Asindi. So he says, we were discussing things in about Arabic and there was a, in the mosque a person we didn't know. He came to us, ilayna. he said to us, Ya ha'ula, you are more in need to look at the establishment of your religion than the establishment of your tongue. Because of course they were talking about the importance of the Arabic language. So he began to tell them about Imam, about the importance of Imam, about Imam in the Quran, the proof for Imam in Islam. At that moment, um, they said to him, who are you? What are you doing? He looked at them and said, There is nothing between you and the Imam of your time except this wall. Yes, and he pointed to the wall. Yes, and then they said, you mean he is here? He's been kept here? And then we recognized that he is one of the Shia. And then we said to him, you must go away. We're going to be caught. He says, la wallahi, you will never be caught because I have not told you this except through the command of him. Subhanallah. So even though Imam al Kadhim was in the dungeons, he was able still to communicate with some of the Shia and to keep mobilizing, to keep inspiring, to keep passing on. That's why people who came to see him, who tried to incite him or entice him or any other way, they immediately would turn into his followers. Isn't it? They would turn into people who would stand in awe by his um, beauty and his uh, spiritual strength. And his devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of those individuals, of course, was one of the Shia, Ali ibn Suwayd, somehow was able to come to see the Imam in his last few days. Because what had happened was this wretched individual, a Sindhi ibn Shahid, he had gathered around 80 of the well-known kind of 
scholars or uh, tribesmen, and he wanted to show them that Imam al Kadhim was still alive. But he had already passed on the poison to Imam al Kadhim, thinking Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam does not know. The poison took three days. Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam was poisoned for three days, as according to so many narrations. But perhaps in the first day, they had gathered, these people had gathered, and uh, this wretched individual looked at them and said, look, Musa ibn Ja'far is alive. You know, there are some issues. Don't worry, everything will be fine. Imam disgraces him in front of all of them and says, it will not be because you have poisoned me. Yes. So they were all, they leave this session in shock. Yes thinking how will this particular news spread. But this man, Ali bin Suwaid, he managed to see Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam, and he says to him, they're Shia, Ayyika, they're desperate to see you. Everybody is really yearning to meet you, O Imam. Imam said, don't worry, they will meet me on Friday. Come out and you will see me on the bridge of Baghdad, ala Jisri Baghdad. This man was so delighted. He came out of the prison, this prison that was so dark that no one was able to see the day or night. Yes, and he came out and he went and said to some of the Shia, there may be good news. We may be able to see the Imam. And so some of them came slowly, gradually on the 25th of the month of Rajab, year 183 after Hijrah. They came to this famous Jisr of Baghdad, the bridge of Baghdad, waiting to see what happens. All of a sudden, they see from far four individuals carrying a coffin. And then they left the coffin on the ground. Allah. They just left it. And then they began to cry out, Hada Imam al Rafira. This is the Imam of the Rafirites. And what happened was, Wallah, the heart cries, the eyes tears up. When recording how Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was treated, his beacon of light was left there. Yes? Slowly people started to gather. Who is this person? What has happened to him? Why is he here? Yes? Why is he being left here on the bridge just like this? When they remove the covering, they find their Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Salamullahi alayhi. And he had left this world. And then a Christian doctor who was passing by, he say to him, Oh man, we beg you, you're a physician, come and see what has happened to him. This man sits, looks at Imam alayhi salam, holds his hands, then he looks at them and says, Does he have any family members? He say, No, he doesn't have any family members. Why do you ask? He said, because you need to tell them this man has been poisoned. Narration say that when he was left there, he still had the chains in his hands. He still had the chains. Imam al Kadhim, they had bought him with the chains in his hands. And that was when the news had spread around Baghdad. That Musa ibn Jafar, Babul Hawa'ij, has left this world, that he has been poisoned. People gathered far and wide to come and bid their farewell to the holy Imam, the grandson of Rasulullah. And of course, the eighth holy Imam, Ali ibn Musa Rida, peace be upon him, would arrive, would perform the salah on the body of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. But I wonder what did he say to his father, having not seen him for so many years? I wonder the conversation that Ali ibn Musa Rida would have with his father, Imam al Kadhim. The poet says, maybe you said, Ya Gharib al Ghuraba, you said to your father, 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 what did they do to you in the dungeons? How did they treat you, O oh Father? Why did they deprive us from seeing you? How is it that you look so thin, O oh Father? How is it that you have lost so much, O oh Father? Your kindness and your warmth and your generosity we miss, O oh my dear Father. Allahu Akbar. What a conversation, yes, between the Father and the Son. The Ahl al-Bayt, usually 
they have an opportunity Allah to have this conversation yes Imam al Askari would have this conversation with whom? With Imam al Mahdi. Imam al Hadi would have this conversation with Imam al Askari. Yes. Uh, we have the uh, conversation between Imam al Kadhim and Imam al Sadiq. We have the conversation between Imam al Baqir and Imam Zain al Abideen. Imam Zain al Abideen, that moment when he was leaving this world, all these conversations break their hearts because they all go back to Karbala. Yes. They go back to Karbala, Imam Zain al Abideen looks at Imam al Baqir. He says, come next to me, my son Muhammad. Imam al Baqir comes next to his father. Yes, this is Wida'ah. Imam al Baqir looks at Imam al Sajjad weeping. He wonders why, oh my father, Ali ibn al Hussein, you are next to me, my beloved son Muhammad. My father Hussein was gharib in Karbala. There was no one next to him. That moment, Imam al Baqir hugs the body of his father, Imam al-Sajjad, places the hand on his chest kindly and gently. Imam al-Sajjad begins to cry even more. He says, Oh my son Muhammad, your blessed hand is on my chest. It gives me warmth. What was on the chest of my father, Hussein? <laughs> We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a shafa'ah of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We mentioned Baghdad many times today. The subject of discussion was the tashayyu of Baghdad. Ya Allah, bihaqqi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Those of us who have been blessed to go to the shrines of Kaldamein, those of us who live in that area or have become so accustomed to stand in that place of serenity and tranquility. Ya Rabbil Alameen, grant us the tawfiq continuously to perform ziyara of the shrines of the seventh and the ninth Imam. Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, make us of those who follow in the footsteps of Imam al Kadhim. Allow us to build a legacy, a legacy of benefit and indeed success, both for ourselves and all of humanity. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you to raise us with Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Our hajat, Ya Allah, we ask you in the name of Babu al-Hawa'ij, Musa ibn Ja'far. Ya Rabbil Alameen, fulfill our hajat. There are many of our brothers and sisters who are suffering with conditions, especially with COVID-19. All around the world, there are some ulama. Ya Allah, grant them shifa. Bihaqqi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, bihaqqi Babu al-Hawa'ij, Musa ibn Ja'far. I ask you all to remember your marhumeen with Surah Al-Mubarakah Al-Fatiha. मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो तेरी जागीर से चल परा काफिला मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो तेरी जागीर से चल परा काफिला मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो तुझको देखे बिना चैन आता नहीं नो के ने जापे सर तेरा मिलता नहीं मैं जियारत करूं किस तरह ये बता मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो तेरी जागीर से चल परा काफिला मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो लाज रख लो बहन की बरादर मेरे खाके मक तल मेरे सर का पर्दा बने हुक्म दे 
तो जरा मुंतजिर है हवा मेरे आजी कहा हो तेरी जागीर से चल परा काफिला मेरे गाजी कहा हो तेरे बाजू मुझे रास्ते में मिले मैंने चादर समझ कर वो सर पर रखे बाजुओं से तेरा पूछती हूँ पता मेरे गाजी कहा हो तेरी जागीर से चल परा काफिला मेरे गाजी कहा हो मैंने बचपन में लो री सुनाई तुझे मैंने चलना सिखा या था भाई तुझे राह पर खार पर मुझको चलना सिखा मेरे गाजी कहा हो तेरी जागीर से चल परा काफिला मेरे गाजी कहा हो मोद मोहम्मद सलवाद मोहम्मद वाल मोहम्मद بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا امير المؤمنين يا سيد الوصيين السلام عليك يا فاطمه الزهراء سيدتي نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا ابا عبد الله الحسين وعلى تسعة المأسومين من ذريتك علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والحجة بن الحسن القائم المنتظر المهدي عجل الله تعالى فرجك وسهل الله تعالى مخرجك وظهورك والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم سورة المباركة الفاتحة